from the New York City area, welcome to the Badass Counseling Show, where the master badass himself, Sven Erlinson, takes you deep and gives balm for the soul, baby. Hello and welcome back to the Badass Counseling Show. It's great to have you here. My name is Sven Erlinson. I am the host of this fine establishment. Whether you are tuning in from Toronto or Dublin or my Kiwi friends way, way, way down south or in Chicago, Denver, Seattle, Minneapolis or Big D, it's great to have you here joining us. I'm joined in studio by KC over in Dabut. And Rob, the rocket right next to me. Rob. Good day, sir. Good day to you. How you been, man? I, I've been great. For those of you listening to the podcast, Sven's wearing a Santa hat. I realize it's January 4th that this is dropping, but the live stream is before Christmas, so it's okay. And technically, for those of you who adhere to liturgical seasons, we are still in Christmas tide, even on January 4th, and we would then uh, be entering Advent, and we are not in Advent yet. So Santa is always in season, uh, but particularly so during t- Christmas tide, Santa goes out of season when Epiphany starts. Always welcome, Santa. Glad you're here. <laughs> well, thank you, young man. Rob. I'm going to turn you loose here. We've got two guests, and we're going to take them at the same time. Uh, both uh, have uh, are female, and so I need you all to tune in and uh, draw the distinction, note the differences in their voices so you can keep them straight in your head. But, Rob, I want you to tell us, please, about Kirsten and Ruby. All right, then, Sven. I've got their bios right here. Kirsten wrote in and said, I'm 32 years old and sell heavy equipment in the mountains of Idaho. I have three children with three different men, my first at age 17, and I'm almost four years into my fourth abusive relationship that I'm desperately trying to get out of. We've been on and off, married and divorced, and I still can't get him to leave. I am several chapters into your book and have never known such pain as I dig up and through the trauma of childhood and the current toxic ways I am running from my pain. These behaviors include jumping from one broken, abusive man to the next, addiction to sex, and the feelings of being wanted, sleeping with the occasional married man because there is no fear of attachment, and moving from place to place and job to job. I have a degree in nutrition (coughs) science and make decent money in my sales career, but I am terrified of ruining it all again and feel more and more stuck. I'm looking for contentment and the courage to stand up for myself, proving to my children and myself that it can be done Hoping you can help. Thanks. And then we also heard from Ruby. Ruby says, hi, I was in a marriage for 26 years. He was my high school sweetheart. We got married young. I supported him, loved him, and held him up through many ups and downs, including unemployment, alcoholism, and abuse. I was always loving and supportive and loyal. I never distrusted him, not once. I thought we were lifers. A year ago, our son had a major mental health crisis, and a month later, my dad passed, and two months later, I found out that my husband had been cheating and was in love with somebody else. After taking some time to process, I approached him and asked that we do counseling and work through this, only to have him decline with a request for a divorce. Only recently, I found out that this relationship with the other woman had been going on for 18 years, not six months as he had originally admitted to. Fast forward to today, I am dating. I am happy and trying to find joy in my new life. I'm trying to leave behind all the trauma, but I have recently found out with my new guy, I'm feeling jealous. These are emotions I have never had in my entire life. Never once have I felt jealous about another woman. It's unnerving. I fully know where these feelings are coming from, but my new guy has never given me a reason to distrust him. I told my new guy about my feelings, rightfully so. He was offended, but still... Every time we are together and his phone dings, I worry and wonder if it's another girl. Help, I don't know what to do or how to get past these feelings of jealousy and mistrust. I don't want to sabotage this. I feel like we have something that could turn out beautiful. Um, Two very powerful stories, not completely dissimilar. Uh, One really about cheating and the other about some really bad relationships. Um, uh, so let's just go ahead and dive right in. Uh, <clears throat> Ruby, I'm going to start with you, and then we'll toggle over to Kirsten and back and forth. 18 years. 18 yeah. years. Uh, just out of curiosity, how long have you and your 26-year husband uh, been apart? 
Um, about 10 months. 10 months, 18 years. Okay. And you've been with New Guy for how long? Uh, two and a half months. Two and a half months. months. Two and a half months. All right. And let me ask you, when you heard that, which was harder for you? When you heard that he had been cheating for quote unquote six months or when you heard that he had been cheating for 18 years, which was, was harder? The 18 years. The 18 years. And single biggest emotion you felt slash feel still uh, when discovering that he had been cheating on you for 18 years? Angry. And I'm upset with myself that I didn't recognize or see anything before. Okay. Um, And when you say upset with yourself, do you mean angry at yourself? I guess. Yeah, I guess that could be one of them. If there's something bigger, tell me if it's not anger at yourself. (laughs) I can't place it. I don't Do your best. really thought. Do your best. Take a shot at it. You can change your mind in two minutes if you want, or two days. <laughs> I think I'm more sad. Sad. I'm just sad. Okay. And are you sad uh, that you didn't see it sooner? What's your greatest sadness? Is your greatest sadness that I didn't see it sooner or that this relationship was done or that it is presently done or that... Uh, you feel so sad for how you were treated or something else. What is the greatest sadness in all of this for you? That he wasted 18 years of my life, that he didn't have the decency or respect for me to come to me sooner um, and say something that, you know, he let things continue. He continued to, you know, be a part of the family and, wasn't wasn't able to yeah. to come and talk yeah. to me. A profound act of uh, cowardice. I'm just curious if you had if I forced you to put a, or asked you to put a percentage on your anger and your sadness uh, upon hearing of the 18 years and and even now, what percent are you angry? What percent are you sad? Is it 60, 40, 20, 80? What what percent are you angry? What percent are you sad? Yeah, 20, 80. 25, 75. Uh, 25 is the anger? It's the greater, yes. 25% is the anger. And 75% is the sadness. And um, just out of curiosity, um, you were only out of that relationship about seven and a half months uh, before discovering this new fellow. And Mm -hmm. congratulations on uh, discovering a new fellow. That's great. That's a nice feeling. Um, How much of the anger and sadness, if you were to give me a percentage, if you were to lump those two together, along with all the other feelings, what percentage of all the feelings after a 26-year marriage and 18-year cheating, what percentage of your feelings since discovering all of this do you think you've actually gotten out of you? I think I've gotten through a lot of the anger. Um, And I have had moments of intense grief. Um, I have... I still have moments of sadness. Um, Mm. I still have to deal with him. He still lives in the home. He refuses to leave. And so I'm constantly having to deal with that. You two live under the same roof, you're saying? Unfortunately, yes. And the divorce is not final, presumably? No, it's not. I see. And um, so you're still having to interact with him. Is there a projected uh, final date for the divorce being finalized? That's all on my shoulders. Um, So it's whenever I get, I see you, hopefully in the new year, in the next couple of months, Uh, I can push it forward. uh, I can push it forward or will push it forward because you- I will push it over. And and I'm just curious, um, and I'm just trying to understand, what's the reason Mm -hmm. you haven't pushed it forward up till now? Well, I don't know how the laws are in the States, but we have to be separated, legally separated for one year in Canada before we can launch a petition to the courts for a divorce. Gotcha. Gotcha. It's that, it's similar in some States in the U S. Um, okay. So you're stuck with them and you guys are stuck, um, at least in each other's orbit, uh, till for presumably a, another few months, right? Um, at the very least. Okay. And so you're struggling now, uh, in this new relationship, primary issue you're struggling with, if I'm hearing you correctly, is jealousy. Is that correct? Yeah. I, I, I guess if I was to put a name to it, yeah. Jealousy or mistrust, maybe. Yeah. 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 And that both of those are rooted in fear. Mm-hmm. 
terrified of getting hurt again. Am I correct? Mm. Okay. And uh, let me ask you, what are you doing presently with those feelings of fear when they're coming up? When you hear the ding on his phone, what are you <laughs> doing with those feelings of fear? What I have done in the past, there was one event in particular, but I separated myself. I walked away. I had to figure out what it was I was feeling. I had to process things. Um, and when I spoke with him after, I I explained to him that, you know, I am feeling a bit uneasy and uncomfortable. And this is why. And I told him exactly, exactly why I was feeling that way. Mm-hmm. And the trauma of my past and, and whatnot. So... And then, so you told him that, you got away, named your feeling, came back, told him, this is my trauma of my past, and then, then what? In other words, what I'm, I guess what I'm getting at is, what is your history in your life with uh, what you do when feelings come up that might be uncomfortable or painful feelings? What traditionally have you done with your own feelings? Stuff them down, uh, sit down, feel it, journal about it, um, go ahead and punch somebody in the face, what has been your (laughs) mode of operation? Now, I tend to sit down, mull it over. Um, Yes, I will journal. I will write it down uh, in order that I can process it. Once I've processed it, figured out where it's coming from, what the root is, then I will go and speak to the individual about it. Okay. And address the issue. Okay. So what we've got clearly then in this case is that The fear is you have a massive amount of fear because of this pain you've experienced. And this fear is now beginning to uh, pull at the fabric of a new relationship, trying to start a new relationship. You yourself said to me that while you feel like you've processed the anger of the past relationship, the sadness is still there, but there is clearly anger still there among other emotions. And so those feelings are in you. And you had a 26 year relationship. Mm -hmm. That's a massive amount of memories, and all of those memories have charges attached to them. Some of them negative, many of them probably positive, happy memories, and so on and so forth. All of those emotional charges from that relationship are still inside of you, and now they're all tainted. So you've got tainted memories. Uh, Now they're all tinged with questioning, distrust, uncertainty, anger, sadness, everything. You've got 26 years of emotions inside of you. And every single one of those, it's like your love cup is full of these memories with emotional charges. Think of like electrons are uh, spinning around the nucleus, the electrical charge. So you drop in a new electrical charge and all of those electrical charges go and you're firing and your insides are going nuts, (laughs) going bananas. And we're seeing it in one case in particular, we're seeing it in jealousy. We're seeing it in the fear. When the ding on the phone goes off, all those emotional charges start electrifying. Okay, I want to shift over. Okay, Kirsten, so you've uh, had a series of relationships. You have three different children by three different men. No shame in that. Nothing wrong with that. Um, But you're almost four years into my fourth abusive relationship. I uh, need to hear, if you would, types of abuse or type of abuse that you are experiencing in this relationship, please. Um, in this relationship, it's been, it's been a roller coaster. Um, everything, I, it, extreme verbal abuse. I've, I'm called names all the time. <laughs> um, uh, financial abuse. So if I'm not working, uh, I'm worthless. If I am working, I'm a terrible mom because I'm not home with my kids and I never make enough money. Um, He owns his own business, so he likes it when I don't work and do things for him. Um, But I don't have any income of my own. So when he has to pay for things, anytime he gets mad at me, he will turn off the debit card that I'm allowed to use to pay my bills. What a dick. Go ahead. Uh, so, so that that was our biggest issue. That's actually what led. So we got um, we got married after he left. And went to Thailand and uh, he came back and begged me to marry him. And I don't know what I was thinking, <laughs> um, but I did. Uh, we It was like a, a quick elopement down to Vegas. And I quit my job again, the one that I had found in my own house. And I left my house and I, I moved back to Idaho um, from Oregon. And uh, 
So then the same thing started happening. Um, I didn't have any money. He cut it off. Um, I started going into debt. And so I decided to get a job. Um, and he was extremely angry about that. Uh, he fought me every step of the way. Um, but once I did, uh, he he filed for divorce. Um, and then I signed the papers. And he got mad at me for signing them. <laughs> so I uh, I, don't, I didn't really know what to do. Um I tried to leave, or I'm sorry, I asked him to leave because the house that uh, we're renting right now, it's in both of our names. Um, he has three other houses in Alabama, Florida, and another one here in Idaho. And uh, I asked him to leave because I have three kids and my mother is living with me right now. Um, and he refused. Um, but then when I said I was going to leave, he told me he would ruin my life in any way possible. So I'm kind of trapped right now. Um, he's the kind of person that has pretty much unlimited money. And uh, if he wanted to sue somebody that owed him $500, he would spend $10,000 doing it. So I don't know what he's capable of as far as ruining my life, as he puts it. But it's terrifying. And I don't know that I'm emotionally capable of handling that right now. And so if I'm hearing you right now, then you are feeling trapped your children are trapped, really. Your, your mother is trapped, uh, but particularly you and your children are trapped, if I'm hearing you correctly, right? That's how it feels, yeah. And oh, don't does. get me wrong, when it comes to my kids, it's 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 strange. He's he's extremely loving and, and you know, father like. It, they're not his children, but the, he's he's very father like. He always you know dotes on them, um, but. When it comes to me, he's not he's not afraid to call me names or or do anything like that. So in my kids' eyes, he does seem like a good person, but behind closed doors, it's it's very different. How old are your children? Um, I have a fourteen year old, an eight year old, and a three year old. And a three year old. Does he call you names or treat you uh, poorly around the kids? Um, I'm sure they've overheard it. Um, there are times where we're arguing and, uh, he'll walk out and my, my teenager will be in the living room and he'll say, there's your mom going crazy again. She's always so crazy. Okay. All right. Um, first of all, it's fucking horrible that this guy is such a petty fuck. Um, I really don't like him. Um, got to get it out of my system. He can go fuck himself. Um, I am so sorry you're in this relationship uh, that you're in this situation. Um, he may uh, try to be all fucking kumbaya with your kids, but they're seeing it and they're hearing it, which unfortunately means you are conditioning them. You are conditioning them that this is what love is. You are conditioning them that this is how a woman can be treated. You're conditioning them that this is how men can act towards women. That You are normalizing this as what love is. So guess what they're going to do? when your 14 year old has first boyfriend, whatever, or goes to get into a relationship later, you are not, and I'm not saying this to scold, I'm saying simply to educate that you are conditioning your children to walk into precisely this. And they're gonna say things like, I married my dad. And That's why I'm <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but it's scary. And I understand that you're scary. And clearly, He's controlling you and wanting to control you. And clearly this very small man operates on fear. Fear. He needs you to be afraid of him. And he's happy to do that. And we know he's a small man because every guy is conditioned that you don't pick on somebody smaller than you. Don't hit a girl. Don't pick on, don't take advantage of other people. Don't hurt other people, particularly somebody weaker, smaller, female. And it's gender biased, I know, but that's how most guys, at least in the U.S., are conditioned, are grown up. So here he is, controlling, hurting, abusing a woman. So that's how I know he's a small man, right? Uh, it doesn't change the fact that you are terrified. Um, and yet, uh, and so you you want him to leave, and he says no. Of course he's going to say no, and the reason he says no is because it's what you want. It's what you want. And anything that you want, he's going to use as a mechanism for controlling you, either to be able to hurt you or to be able to get you to do what he wants, which is precisely what he's doing. He's keeping you trapped using fear and the fact that he knows you want him to leave. He has plenty of places he could go, but he's not going, fuck you. I'm going to stay just to fuck with you. 
And so um, what usually happens in these cases is that your pain of feeling trapped and your kids being trapped and seeing the effect this is having on your kids and seeing that you're not getting them out of this and that I am normalizing this and your own feelings of pain and misery in this, eventually it gets so bad that you will take action. You're just not there yet, right? Eventually the pain of what you're going through will get so bad that you'll be like, listen, if he brings it on, he brings it on, but I have to get the fuck out of here and I have to get my kids out of here. It, what would you say presently, if you were to give a percentage to it, what would you say is your present percentage uh, pain level at? Are you at 40%? Are you at 67%? Are you at 2%, 99%? Where are you at pain level wise? That's that's a hard question to answer. I'm all things considered, that includes financial pain, emotional pain, fucking frustration, seeing your kids set, whatever it is, what all forms of pain congealed into one ball, what percent? How big is that ball of pain in you? I mean, we're we're getting close to a hundred percent at this point. Okay. Yeah, that's understandable. Um, well, let me ask you, uh, you're reading the book. And going into it, and you're digging up such pain, uh, you say, and the trauma of childhood and the current toxic ways of all the stuff that you're bringing up uh, from your past and experiencing now, what's the hardest thing, if you were to distill it down to one sentence, what's the biggest, scariest, hardest, ugliest thing inside of you? The biggest, ugliest thing was probably, so when it was actually chapter one, uh, I, there were so many things that I could have written down so many things that I've been through. Um, and the, the, the one thing that really stood out was actually all the way back when I was 13 and, uh, my, my mom left, <laughs> um, she, uh, took my siblings, um, and she came, um, my, they had been, she was my stepmom. My, my, I didn't know my biological mom until I was way later. Um, but when my stepmom left, she took my dad and her kids and, um, she packed everything up. Her parents came while my dad was at work and, uh, she, um, she pulled me aside after they took everything from our house and she'd been my mom for my, uh, for about 10 years. Um, and she, she packed everything up and then pulled me aside and asked me, she's like, do you want to come with me or do you want to stay with your dad? Um, and I told her, I it was, I felt like it was kind of a loyalty test at that time. So I decided to stay with my dad. I had to take care of my dad, I said. And uh, she left and I didn't see any of them again for years and years. And my dad fell into alcoholism extraordinarily bad and I got shipped to another family member I didn't know so that was that's probably the um the hardest part for me just uh I, I felt like in that moment I chose my dad and he didn't choose me back so that that one probably and, and when you think about that event what is the single biggest emotion that your dad not choosing you back makes you feel extremely angry <laughs> extremely angry uh, yeah i'm i'm very angry about that i'm a little i'm a little bitter as you should be as you should be and just out of curiosity is your father still alive he is he is um i we don't have the greatest relationship i know he tries he um after several i think it was like after 10 years mm -hmm. after that he finally went to the um Actually, after my son was born, he he went to the VA and he got um, much needed counseling and therapy. Um, he but got you don't sober. want a relationship with him now. Is that correct? I do. And, okay. So I you do. want a relationship with him. You're very, very angry at him. You want a relationship with him. And the single biggest reason you want a relationship with him is what? If you had a relationship, then what? In one sentence or less, if I had a relationship with dad, then what? Hmm. I would feel complete. I would feel like I have a family. And if you felt complete and had a family, despite the fact that you have two kids of your own, um, I would feel complete, have a family, and that would make you feel what? Like I was worth something. You need dad to choose you 
Because when he didn't choose you, you felt so unwanted. I must be worth nothing. A child's brain, a teenager's brain. And it's actually kind of logical. We can understand why a 13-year-old would think that. Why a 15, a 17, a 24, a 27, a 32-year-old woman. We can understand why you think that. Because that kid wasn't chosen. There must be something wrong with me. I'm worthless. Nobody wants me. My mommy left me. And my daddy doesn't want me. You have been unwanted for most of your life, or that is how it has felt. And so you've reached out in every direction to all the men, and no one blames you for that. There's no shame in that. You're still that little girl wanting to be wanted, and it feels so good. That's why the sex feels so good too. For this moment in time, I am wanted. I am wanted, and it feels so good. And it's sad. That little girl has been wanting to be wanted the entire time. And I want to come back and ask you uh, a couple of questions. But before we do, uh, I'm going to check in with Ruby. But before we do that, we're going to take a short break. I've been doing some real healing work in my life, and I mean hardcore. But I've been craving something new to level up. A friend of mine told me about this badass counselor. I got to admit, I rolled my eyes. Then I watched a few of his videos, and yes, this is the guy. I went and got his audiobook, Badass Wisdom. Holy shit. Absolute ass-kicking, inspiring, deep, powerful shit, period. If you don't get this book, you're making a huge mistake. So do you got the guts to go big with your self-care? Go to badasscounseling.com, get the book Badass Wisdom now. This show provides soul counseling intended to entertain and inform and is not medical advice. Now, back to the badass. We are back. And we've got Ruby and Kirsten, uh, some very compelling stories. Ruby, I want to ask you, you, there's this trauma from your past that is now infecting this new relationship. And this is why I am so, uh, well, every therapist says it, but I'm adamant, I hammer people, that if you're not, if you don't take time between relationships to flush out all of the pain, the fears, the bullshit beliefs that grew in you from the past relationship, you're walking into the next relationship with all of that emotional baggage, all of that trauma, all of those charges inside of you. And they're going to be electrified. They are going to be triggered. And we're seeing that in very plainly in the jealous, in the jealousy stuff. Um, And so let me ask you, Ruby, what is your greatest fear in taking time and being deliberate about going into all of the feelings, 26 years worth of feelings. What's your biggest fear that if you were to welcome all of this and go into all of it and feel all of it, what's your biggest fear? In in the efforts to process it out, to get it all out, what's the biggest fear? I don't, I don't think I have the biggest fear. Okay. Uh, just out of curiosity, what is the reason uh, you're in a relationship only seven and a half months out of coming out of a 26 year relationship. I realized, I mean, our relationship was over long before. Um, And I had come to that realization. I was moving slowly. I knew that our relationship would eventually come to its natural end once the children had launched and moved out of the home. Um, So I was staying in order that, you know, the kids could finish out their life here. And, but I knew that it was not something that I wanted to continue. For you personally, how long ago was the relationship over, the 26-year marriage? Uh, About five years ago. Five years ago, so at about 21 years. And uh, you wanted to get the kids to the point where they could move out on their own life before you dropped the bomb uh, that mom and dad are breaking up. Um, how many kids do you have? I have two. Two kids. Um, and they're now out of the house. Uh, just out of- No, and, they're not. Oh, they're not. They're at they're, home? Yeah. Okay. Um, and how are they taking it that mom and dad are getting a divorce? My youngest one is actually doing quite well. 
um, my older one is very angry. Uh, he places the blame on me. Um, and I believe that that is because I'm the one that communicates. I'm the one that told the children that this was happening. Their father was there, but he had nothing to say. Um, and so, yeah, my 21 year old has, is quite angry with me about it and, and has angry inside well, about it. Yeah, and that's good. That's good. It's the other one that I'd even be more concerned about. It's the ones that take it well that aren't feeling the feelings. They're, it's being stuffed down. There's no way that the two people you love the very most in the entire world, that they're splitting and you don't have powerful emotions because that mm-hmm. has been their normal for 18 or 20 years or whatever. There's no way that both of those kids aren't hypercharged with massive emotion. And it's when we stuff down those emotions, that's where we get into problems later. So the one that's feeling anger towards you, that anger is actually a blessing. doesn't feel good, but Uh it's actually a blessing because it's an indicator that that child is feeling things and allowing themselves to feel it. And they, that child then needs avenues for getting that out of them, whether it be Uh journaling, counseling, um, both your kids need that. And I would uh, encourage you to strongly push for that in their lives, though they are no longer minors. um, You you don't have that. Okay. Oh, one is. Okay. So one is, I got you. Gotcha. All right. So you came to me asking about jealousy. I don't know how to do or how to get past these feelings of jealousy and mistrust. All right. So then let's just ask you, what is your grand fear in all of this? In one sentence or less, what is your fear that is driving the jealousy? Jealousy is fundamentally it's fear of what for you? That there is other people in the backgrounds that there's, um, and that I'm going to have this feeling with, I mean, might not be this relationship, but am I going to mistrust every single relationship? Am I going to second guess every single person that I'm with from here on out? Because he has created that, maybe created that mistrust in me. Right. Yes, you are going to distrust every single one and you're going to distrust them massively and you are going to spend months and years writhing in fear. I guarantee it. Unless, unless you actually go into those fears. What you need to be doing in your journaling is writing your fucking ass off about fear and, and gaming out what would it feel like if... What's my greatest fear if he cheats? What, uh, how does it feel right now when I hear the phone ding? And you need to be writing that, that shit out. You need to be writing letters to your present guy and that you don't give to him. I'm so terrified you're gonna blah, blah, blah. Yes, I know you haven't blah, blah, blah. I'm so scared and I'm so mad that you have a phone. I don't want you to have a phone because that way I won't feel the fear or whatever it is you're feeling everything. Mm-hmm. Furthermore, you need to be writing letters to your ex of absolute hatred. Oh, I have. Great. <laughs> and there needs to be more because as you yourself said, I still feel sadness 75% and anger 25%. So mm-hmm. you still have strong feelings and all of that sadness and all of that anger, you are still in the process of grieving. Even if it was done five years ago, if you had actually done all the work and there's no shame that you didn't, who gives a shit? But if you had, you wouldn't still be feeling the sadness and the anger. All right, so that tells us there's still feelings inside of there. And those are in fact filtering into uh, this new relationship. And because of the anger, because of the uh, the pain that was caused to you, you are now in a state of immense fear in a relationship with someone who has given you no reason to believe it. Mm-hmm. And and so let me ask you then, um, if that your fear is that there's somebody else, okay? Uh, two questions. One, what if there is? Then what? Then I, I walk. Okay. What would you feel if you discovered he has somebody else? I think my first reaction would be sadness. Um, and then it would I would turn it on myself, probably. Turn what have I yourself. done? What have I done to to cause this? Why? Right. Why? Uh, yeah. have you, how much have you turned it on yourself regarding your husband, ex husband, um, cheating on you for eighteen years? How much ha- of the what's wrong with me has has there been? About a hundred percent of it. Right. Right. Um, if you're to be totally honest, and I'm sure you have been up to this point. Um, 
How much uh, journaling have you done on that or working with your therapist have you done on that? Not a lot. Not a lot. Yeah. Uh, just out of curiosity, was there ever conveyed to you in your childhood uh, that you're no good, that you're not good enough? Uh, no. Okay. What were the messages you got in childhood regarding either A, being wanted, B, being lovable, unlovable, and regarding your own self-mattering? I was always told that I was loved. I was. We were always told that, you know, we were important. Um, I think that I was raised to be the child or the girl that, you know, you look after the guys, you know, they come home from work, you make them dinner. My mom set, you know, a certain example that they come home, you serve them. But I didn't, I was never made to feel like I was unwanted. Fair. What's the implicit message in that you are taught that your job is to serve them? What's the message What's being conveyed to the child implicitly in terms of the child's worth or sense of identity or sense of self? That we are less than that person. We're not. Right. That they're primary and you are secondary. Thus, um, you're only lovable as a secondary person. Furthermore, to a large degree, the message is your worth, your lovability is tied to performance, serving mm -hmm. them. Your lovability is tied to how well you serve. So while you were getting the messages of I love you, which is great, don't get me wrong, that's a great message, but you were getting these other messages of your lovability is tied to your performance, your service of the person. So in a way, there's a bit of a conflict, a conflicting message. One is tied to being, I love you for who you are, uh, daughter. The other is tied to your, what I'm modeling for you or teaching you about how to be a wife later that you must serve and then you will be lovable. Then you will fulfill your role as a wife. And so then part of that, or that mm -hmm. plays in in part in this situation that what did I do wrong? Let me ask you, um, what in your brain do you believe you did wrong in this marriage? I can't for the life of me tell you. I don't know. Ah. I tried. I did as much and everything, and I gave as much and everything that I could. Right. Yet, and, and it just wasn't good enough. It wasn't enough. It wasn't. Or it was plenty, and you are a good person, and it was plenty. He's just a fucking asshole. See, even though you have no logical reason to believe that you gave him reason to cheat, as if that's even possible, that you you gave him reason, you still believe that you failed and that's why he cheated. That I must have done something wrong, even though, and I ask you, what'd you do wrong? You're like, I don't fucking know. I really, really tried. I didn't do anything wrong. Oh, so you have no logical reason to believe that you failed him, and yet you still feel like I must have done something wrong. That tells me there's some virus infecting the operating system. There's some virus inside of you that says, I fucked up. Somehow this is my fault. And it's bullshit. That virus came from somewhere. That virus came from somewhere. Because logically, you didn't do anything fucking wrong. Furthermore, even if you had failed, cheating is not the answer. It just as a little spanking to people who think that, well, my wife didn't do her job or my husband, he's a dick, so I'm going to cheat. Fuck you. And the relationship. Don't fucking destroy the other person. Right. The problem in this equation it, uh, isn't just the jealousy. It's that you are preconditioned to believe that I must have done something wrong. That if somebody hurts me, I'm at fault. Do you see the problem? Yeah. Kirsten, I want to know right now, we got pretty deep with you, Kirsten. We did pretty quickly there. And looking at the shit from the past and so forth, I, I'm curious, Kirsten, what's going on inside of you right now? If you're to be totally honest. Exhaustion. I'm, I'm tired. What's the, <laughs> like, what's the most exhausting part? Waking up every day 
in this relationship knowing that it's not going to last and just waiting for, um, I, I feel like I'm just walking a tightrope right now. Um, right. right. You had told us this, this very compelling story of being 13 years old. Your dad didn't choose you back. Your stepmom offered to take you and you thought, well, I got to stay and take care of my dad. There's obviously a problem, even in that thought, even if that was just your surface reasoning, the notion that a 13 year old has to take care of an adult. If there was even an ounce of that dynamic in the relationship that you had with your father, highly problematic because a child is not responsible for a fucking adult. Grow up and be a fucking adult, dad. And then we see dad sort of slither into this alcoholism and, and so forth and leave his daughter high and dry. This daughter, and I, and you had said, he didn't choose me back. And I said, if he had, then what? And then I'd feel complete and like I have a family. And then I said, and then what? And then you said, I'd feel like I'm worth something. And we established that this feeling of having no worth has been there the whole time. And it makes total sense that that has led to wanting that external validation still wanting it from a father who absolutely failed in his job as a parent. But that's not really accurate, is it? That's not really accurate, is it? Because failing implies that I tried. If I failed to climb the mountain, it sort of means I climbed up halfway and just my knee crapped out, I failed, okay? Um, but he, I'm not hearing that he really fucking tried. I'm hearing that he checked out. He had his own problems. He had his own demons. He had, but I, I don't give a fuck. You failed a child. You quit on a child. It's not really even failing. That's just, that's just fuck off. And so to me, it, just out of curiosity, how old is your father? He's 52. He's, 50. he's 52. So a few years younger than me. Uh, raised in the United States? Um. Born in Sweden, but he um, he's lived here since he was a young adult. Okay. Um, reasonable to assume that he was sort of raised in the ethos that at the very least, the father's job is sort of protect and provide for his family. Was, that, was he sort of of that flavor? Yes. Um, but at the same time, he, he went through, um, my, my grandpa left my farm more with five kids too. So my, my grandpa kind of checked out in his life. Right. And, and, and yet the cultural ethos though, that your father was raised in was that the father's job was what? To provide. Ah, there we go. And see, there's where we run into a glitch. There's where you see, I know I have been to the Western part of the U S where you live and I have seen police cars and many police cars say on the side of them to what and what? Protect and serve. Protect and serve. And men, I mean, really any parent, that's their job. But men in particular in the Western Hemisphere are very often enculturated, raised in your job is to protect and what we call provide. You just use the word provide. But we get so often caught up in the provide that we forget about the protect. Or we think the protect is, oh, my girl doesn't get to date until she's 30. Bad. I'm a tough guy. I'm keeping my family safe. I got my gun. Right? And. I have a gun, gun, who gives a shit? Point isn't the gun. The point is this, there's another type of protect. And it's to protect the spirit of that child, to protect their feelings, to protect their dreams, protect their wants, their passions, their need to be validated, their need to feel like they have worth. And the interesting thing is very often, not always, but very often when I'm working with clients and they've had a parent who has dropped the ball, who really fucked up, I ask them, did they fail to protect or did they fail to provide? And very often, if there was a failure to protect, even if they were provided for, very often the adult child will say, I would have sacrificed all of the providing in the world just to feel protected, to feel safe. Because inside of that safety, is a feeling of wanted, a feeling of mattering, a feeling like I can relax in the world. I can have some peace. You weren't protected. Your father checked out a life and he didn't protect you. And I hate him for it. I do. I'm sure he's a wonderful guy, but I hate this massive thing that he did to a child. And the problem inside of you is that you are looking to connect with someone 
who did the most damage to you, right? So those right. mixed feelings, right? And wanting that. And, and the truth is that 13-year-old girl has a lifetime of feelings inside of her, not to mention we haven't even looked at what your mother might have done. We haven't even touched on that. But the bottom line is your healing, your strength, your new sense of self, you're no longer or less and less needing external validation is going to be found in your capacity to welcome all of those feelings. Whether you choose to have a relationship with your living, breathing father, completely up to you. But it's premature to make that decision because you haven't even allowed up all your feelings. That 13-year-old you is coming with this giant box of all of her feelings saying, please let my feelings out. My feel There was no safe place. No one wanted my feelings. Please, she's saying to you at 32, please let them out so that I can finally feel relief, so that I can finally feel heard, so that I can finally feel important. She's coming to you saying, you're stronger than I was. Please. And the truth is, until those come out, once you do let her feelings out, once you do feel all of that, you are validating her. You are validating your 17-year-old self looking for boys. You are validating your 22-year-old self looking for boys. You are validating yourself by allowing all of those feelings up and out because you are saying, God damn it, I matter. My feelings matter. And then the more I self-validate by getting all of those out, I no longer need as much external validation. Okay. So in your work, in your self-work, you have to go into all those scary, ugly, dirty, nasty feelings and not just feel them, but put pen to paper and write letters to your dad saying, I fucking hate you so much for what you did. You never have to confront real living breathing. And that's not the point because oftentimes when we confront the real living breathing person, it's done, but it's not really done because all the feelings are still in there. You were going to say something. Go ahead. Oh, no, I was, I was going to say, um, I just went through uh, chapter eight the wet cement, I think is what it was, the wet cement. And I and I had to write that letter. And when I started writing it, I didn't think it was going to be very long, but five pages in and I was still writing. <laughs> so it was a... Love it. it was, yeah, I nice. love it. And the truth is there may be about 17 more of those letters uh, inside of you, not to mention then the letters that you don't send to the exes or to the mother that abandoned you or whatever it is the original, the bio mom, and not to mention to the stepmom, whatever is inside of you regarding her, but it's allowing all of that, all of that out because that's the little motor that keeps running that you can't stop. That's the one, all the anxiety and you're looking for a drug and one of your drugs, the way you say it is, it's just sex. It's men, that's the drug, powerful drug. But I have less need for that drug, for that escape, for the, how it quiets all of those inner voices. Because when I have someone here right now pouring love into my love cup, it's like, fuck, I'll do anything. Just stay, just stay. I will do anything. Keep pouring, just even if it's, even if it's only a tiny little bit of love into my love cup, I'll stay. Because it makes me feel wanted. And it makes all those voices go away. It sort of packs, it's a buffer. But once that person leaves, or threatens to leave, or I'm alone. Even though you're begging to be alone now, what happens when you are alone is <laughs> all of those voices and messages from the past come roaring up. And that's the painful shit you said that you've been dredging up as you've been going through the book. I wanna ask you though, in all of this, uh, in all the, of everything that's going on, and particularly um, you said, I am terrified of ruining it all your career and so on and so forth. What is your biggest fear in ruining it all? The fear of what? So um, I've actually become more and more withdrawn. Uh, and that's how I know that I'm getting to the end of this from him. Um, I don't want him to touch me anymore. I don't want to touch him anymore, which is huge for me. <laughs> that's yes, a big, it is. That's, that's great. Thing. That's great. Um, yeah. So uh, I, I definitely know um, that we're getting close, but the only thing that I'm terrified is that over four years, I have quit five jobs. I have moved across the country twice and back to get away from and him. And what's the fear? That I'm going to do it again. Why do you fear that? <laughs> uh, because I've done it so many times. But why do you fear doing it again? I quit, like, ask my first wife how much she hated me for all of the jobs that I quit. I, I tell people all the time, the path to discovering who you really are discovers requires discovering who you're not. 
And sometimes we have to be willing to abort things that don't feel right. And, but you haven't told me what's the fear. I'm afraid of doing it again. Well, what's the fear? Well, I'm afraid of doing it again, but what's the fear? If I do it again, then what? Uh, I'll, uh, if, if I do it again, I'm going to ruin my life. I don't. Nah, nah, you're not going to ruin your life. It'll be hard. It'll be turbulent to restart whatever. You won't ruin your life. Kid, you are 32 fucking years old. You ask any woman listening to this show right now who's over the age of 50, 60, and I got lots of them around the world. You ask them if they would kill to go back to 38 and how ask them how many lives they have lived since they were 32. And they say, oh shit, man, I've had like four lives since then. You're so young, kiddo. You really are. I know you feel old and gosh, I got kids and blah, blah, blah. You got so much life ahead. Do you know how many people, my first ex-wife got her PhD in her late 30s. She finished her degree in her 30s. My second wife reinvented herself in her 40s. She had been a professional dancer, Broadway shows, shit like that. And she started a business. So the notion that you're ruining your life, not even close. But the problem is it feels that way. I want to ask you one question, then I'm going to flip back over to Ruby. And my question is this. Kirsten, if you were to, use your words, ruin your life, or if you were to blow it up the way it presently exists and start over, but blow it up because it's not working, what is the one sentence above all else, one sentence you most fear someone, people saying to you or thinking about you, what would be the one most painful sentence that someone might be thinking about you. There she goes again. There she goes again. And what is implied? What's the implicit message in there she goes again? That I failed. She's a failure. All right. There she goes again. She's failed. And just out of curiosity, how would that feel? I I hate that the most. How would it feel? Uh, heartbreaking. Heartbreaking. Just out of curiosity, there she goes again, failure. She failed. Um, Who would be the one person most likely to say that to you or think that about you? It's actually the people that don't say anything. They say it to other people. Sure, sure. And who is the one among them who is top of the list most likely to say it to other people? Uh, My grandparents. My grandparents. So if I'm hearing you correctly, the pain you most fear is what your grandparents will think of you if you start over again, or is that not accurate? No, no, it is. It's just not what I expected to think. What did you expect to think? Um, I guess I take that back. It's probably my kids. And they might not say it to me, Mm -hmm. but I would be afraid that they would think it. Right. And it, both of those would be painful though. Sounds yeah. like either grandparents or your kids, right? And just out of curiosity of all your kids, which one would it be most painful to know that they're thinking that about you? Your oldest? Yeah. Your oldest, right. Yeah. And the truth is there are gonna be many times in your life when your kids are disappointed in you, when your kids, you know, and you're gonna come off the pedestal at some time. They're gonna realize mom wasn't perfect. Mom failed me, mom made mistakes. That's right. But the bottom line is you can't be afraid to make life better. You can't be afraid to do that. I mean, you can be. Actually, you should. Allow the feelings up. Allow the fear up. Journal it out. Journal it out. Journal it out. But then at some point, you make the fucking decisions. You make the hard decisions because in the end, you know what's best for your kids. And it is the happier you are, the happier they are. The the more fulfilled you are, the more safe they will feel in that love. You can't be afraid to fail short-term to create greater success, happiness, and peace in your home long-term. And that means going into your shit, like you're doing in the book, flushing all that shit out so that you're more present to them, but you're also teaching them such a valuable lesson. And that is if life is shit, quit it, make something better. Even if you got to do it five fucking times and that success story that your kids will brag in their adulthood is my mom kept fighting. 
My mom was willing to fucking quit. She was willing to let her kids be mad at her. She was willing to stand up to her grandparents and say, back the fuck off. Back, you, you know what, grandma, grandpa, you think whatever you want. I don't give a shit. I am kicking, I'm gonna kick some ass. If I gotta quit again, I'm gonna fucking quit again. If I gotta start over, I'm gonna fucking start over. And the day is gonna come when your kid's gonna brag about how kick-ass their mom is. And it's not just gonna be, you know, childhood. Oh, my mommy's the best. No, it's gonna be adult. My mom kept fighting. She found her voice and she stood up and she stopped being afraid of people being disappointed in her. And she started being happy with, proud of herself. And she lived from her center rather than all those voices that have been criticizing her all along. And by doing that, you are helping your children find their strength. You're giving them permission to quit. You're giving them, you're teaching them by your model, you are teaching them how to hear and heed their own voice. Ruby, what are you feeling right now? Back to you. What are you feeling right now, Ruby? Um, it's sad. What's the saddest part for you, Ruby? That I am going to feel like this forever. Right. And the truth is, you will feel like this, as I said, this fear, this jealousy, this, this anxiety, unless you keep flushing it out. You have to, Ruby. There's no choice because you will fuck up your relationships on your side. You will meet perfectly lovely men. I have no doubt that the get fella you're with now is a terrific guy. I have no doubt. But... It's, and it's not that there is something inherently wrong with you. This is the distinction we need to draw here, Ruby. There's nothing, unlike that message that you believe, I fucked up, there must be something wrong with me. That's why he cheated for 18 years. No, he cheated because he's a fucking dick. He could have just ended the relationship, done the decent fucking thing and said, you know what? I got my own shit going on inside of me. He could have ended it, but he didn't. There's nothing wrong with you, but you go there. So the distinction has to be drawn between I of myself, who I am, my native self is flawed versus no, what I've been conditioned to believe. And now you've been conditioned by your last relationship. You've been further conditioned to believe something's wrong with you. Those are two distinctly different things. Your authentic self being bad or this conditioning being bad that's inside of you. And the way we get that conditioning out and the conditioning is what's driving the fear. Fear that I'm gonna fuck up. Fear that someone's not gonna want me. Fear that someone's gonna cheat on me fear that someone's going to hurt me. Mm -hmm. And that's what has to be gone into because otherwise, yes, your conditioning, right? That there's something wrong with you and your conditioning and all the fear that has come as a result of this relationship, it is going to infect your relationships. And your present boyfriend being offended initially, your new guy being offended by you saying you didn't trust him, he has every right to feel that. It's like, whoa, 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 whoa what did I do? You know, and I, and I know you get that. I know you get that. Um, let me ask you this. What's your biggest fear in going into all of these past feelings and allowing them up and sitting in them and journaling about them and allowing them out? What is the fear of touching these and allowing yourself to go into them? I don't think I have any fears okay. of doing that. Good. Then that's what you need to do. And because otherwise the other fear will kick in and, that, and it'll, it'll pervade everything. That's the fear of these feelings staying forever. The way these feelings don't stay forever is you just keep hammering away at them. You keep going in, courageously going in, courageously going in and welcoming them and flushing them out and flushing them out. That's the tool because fear is the worst. Fear is the worst. And, and in your case, it's the fear of being hurt again. In, in Kirsten's case, it's the fear of not being wanted and how that conjures up all those feelings and the fears of being alone and fears of what grandpa is going to think. And in your case, it's the fears of ruining things, right? Getting hurt again, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 Well, ladies, uh, this has been so interesting and so heartwarming that you trusted us with your stories. And there's so many people, you guys have listened to the show before when you've resonated with other people's stories. There are people right now resonating with your stories so that you had the, the trust, the willingness, the courage to share your stories. On behalf of all of our listeners, I wanna express my gratitude to you. Uh, so I, again, to all of our listeners from Dublin to Dubuque, thanks so much for tuning in to The Badass Counseling Show. Have a kick-ass day. The Badass Counseling Show is strictly copyrighted. 
No copies may be made without the express written consent of The Badass Counseling Show, LLC. The Badass Counseling Show is produced by Karen Camparelli and Robert H. Friedman. Executive producer, Sven Erlinson. Original music by two-time Emmy Award-winning composer, Trevor Morris. Have a kick-ass day. Thank you.